probably ought to just get it out there. I used to be a really good kid. I went to Sunday school every week. I made straight A's in school, made honor roll. I uh, was prom king. It was a small town. Uh, and <laughs> I started reading the things that Jesus said, and it just began to mess with me. You know, I, I, uh, I grew up in the church, and I had responded to a call at the altar. You know, those old times they would tell us about Jesus and invite us to come forward and dedicate our lives to Jesus. I did that when I was 11. And then, you know, we, we did it again the next summer. And uh, it was like we came every year. I'd count the days to that revival, and I'd go get born again again. Uh, if you haven't done it, I highly recommend it. But it, it kind of became a moment where... I started to think there's got to be more to being a Christian than just getting born again again uh, every year. And there's got to be more than just believing all the right stuff, right? Because I began to see that the church was very good at teaching me what to believe, but not as good at teaching me how to live and how those beliefs translated into action. And yet, the more I read Jesus, I saw uh, him saying that we're, we're not just called to be believers, even the demons believe we're called to be lovers, that they will know that we are Christians by our love. And then I looked at the church around me, and we weren't always known for love, right? Uh, some years ago, the Barna Research Group went to uh, every state in the United States, and they asked young non-Christians, what do you think of when you... Hear the word Christian. The number one answer was anti-gay. The number one answer that non-Christians said is anti-gay. Number two is judgmental. Number three is hypocritical. I'll stop there because the list doesn't get much better. You know, and as I looked at the list, you know, they continue to say irrelevant, out of touch, prudish, all these things. I thought, how did we get here? Right? Because that's not what people said when they encountered Jesus. You know, folks didn't encounter Jesus and walk away scratching their head going, why doesn't he like gay folks? Like, like what? You know, like he was known for that love and people who were marginalized and excluded were magnetized to him. And I began to realize that in the church, we've uh, become known often more for who we've excluded than who we've embraced. We become known more often uh, for what we're against than what we're for. What broke my heart as I read the list of that survey results was what didn't make it. The number one thing Jesus said, they will know you are Christians by. People did not say love. And that broke my heart. So I, I kind of went on this inward quest. I said, I want to figure this thing out. So I, I, uh, I heard this preacher say, if we, if we find ourselves climbing the ladder of success, success and status, we, we, we should be careful or else on our way up, we might meet Jesus on his way down. And so I, I thought, I'm pursuing all the wrong things. i got to get out of this little bubble I grew up in. And I went to Easter, and I started studying. And I always like how Karl Barth said, uh, we got to read the Bible in one hand, but we need to read the newspaper in the other. And what happened to me as I was studying the Bible at this Christian university is that my friends, uh, one day we were eating in the cafeteria, and they put down a newspaper, and they said, check this out. The front headline said, Church resurrected. And I kept reading, and what it, what it told was the story of these families who were homeless, mothers and children on the north side of Philadelphia that had no place to go. There was a waiting list of over 3,000 families for affordable housing. Shelters were full, and they, they started looking at all the abandoned buildings we have in our city, and they found this old church, this old Catholic church, and they said, this is different. This is different. And they moved into it and they started living there. And I kept reading this story and it ended by saying that the Catholic church had given them an ultimatum of 48 hours. And if they weren't out within two days, they could be arrested for trespassing on church property. <laughs> you know, it's one of those moments where you're like, whoa, something's wrong with that, right? And the, the families were brilliant. They hung a banner on the front of the cathedral that said, how can we worship a homeless man on Sunday? And ignore one on Monday. They held a press conference, right? And they said, we mean no disrespect to the uh, archdiocese or the Catholic officials, but we've talked to the real owner of this building, your boss. 
and the Lord said we can stay. You know, so they stayed, and a student movement sparked at, on our campus where we came alongside of them. And, and, and uh, uh, that, that story went for not for 48 hours, but for months and months. And many of those families got housing. And beyond that crisis, something happened in us. It was in that old cathedral that we started reading about the early church in the book of Acts, right where it says that the, the, the earliest Christians shared everything they had. No one claimed that any of their possessions were their own. And, and it goes on to say that they put their money and their offerings at the apostles' feet and it was distributed as, to folks as they had need. They worshipped in each other's homes and this beautiful vision of a micro church movement, right? And we, we thought, that's beautiful. We got to get back to that a little bit. What was also great is uh, as we were, you know, we thought we're, we were rediscovering the early church for the first time in 2,000 years, you know, and it was wonderful because these older Catholics uh, came alongside us and they said, this is beautiful with all, all the young people and all that, this movement that's happened, it's so fresh. And they said, we want you to know that we've been, um, we've been doing this community thing for a while. We've been trying to live out the early Christian spirituality that you talk about for a lot of years, about 1,600. And they, they became some of our teachers, right? And I, I began to realize the beautiful tradition within Catholicism, you know, because I kept reading about all these great dead people. But then uh, we, we were like, who's still living this out? And we kept meeting these wonderful uh, nuns. And uh, I'll tell you one other side note. I know I'm not supposed to go on side notes in a Theo Ed talk. But anyway, like the, the Catholic clergy actually ended up going to the archdiocese building in the middle of that crisis in the cathedral. And they had an exorcism. Because they said, we are dealing with some serious principalities and powers in the world right now. And they've infected even the church. They were arrested. And uh, when, when they went to trial, it was the Catholic church versus the clergy. And the judge was like, I ain't touching this. And he said, hey, you guys got to write a theological paper about why you went to jail. All right? Now we're done. And, uh, but that, these, they became our mentors. They were rebel rousers. Right? We, we were, we were uh, hanging out with these Catholics that were opening their eyes. You know, and they said, yeah, you know, we, we don't know where this notion came from that Christians are just meant to be such good law-abiding citizens. We need to stir some stuff up sometimes. They said, uh, you know, uh, uh, that, that uh, we, as we got to know them, one of uh, the people that caught our attention was uh, actually Mother Teresa. I mean, I didn't bump into her or anything, but we kept reading about her, you know, and we thought, let's go learn from her. So the great thing about being like um, 18, 20 years old is no one's convinced you that anything's impossible, you know. So we wrote her a letter and she didn't write back. So we just started calling nuns on the phone. And finally, one of them gave us Mother Teresa's number. And I called Calcutta and she picked up the phone. And we're like, all right, you know. And uh, she invited us to come out. So we worked in India. And, um, and uh, so we're there, you know. I go, I go to India and we're, we're working in Calcutta. And sometimes people are like, whoa, you, you worked with Mother Teresa. What was that like? Uh, and I, I, the one thing I remember about Mother Teresa, and I saw her almost every morning. We'd go to worship at 5 o'clock in the morning, and I noticed that her feet were deformed. And I know this might sound a little weird, but, you know, I, I wasn't about to ask her about it. It looked like she had contracted some disease or something, but I wasn't going to go like, what's up with that? I mean, this is Mother Teresa, you know. But one, one day, one of the nuns came up, and they said, have you noticed her feet? And I said, yeah. And she said, listen, we get just enough shoes donated for everybody to get a pair. Mother Teresa doesn't want someone to have a worse pair of shoes than her. So she goes through all the donations and she picks out the worst pair of shoes and she takes them for herself. And after years and years of doing that, it's made her feet look like that. And I remember all those verses I learned in Sunday school, right? Honor the needs of others above your own. Like love your neighbor as yourself and sell what you have and give it to the poor. But I'd never quite seen it fleshed out like that, right? And it was there that I also, in India, I began to realize what prayer does to us and what it did to Mother Teresa. You know, I grew up uh, hearing about prayer as if it was, uh, um, it was kind of like we told God all the things we wanted from God. You know, I, we would do these prayer requests where everybody would say all the things that they want. I remember one of my friend's kids was going to pray and he said, I'm going up to pray. Does anybody want anything? You know, it's kind of like he's <laughs> a waiter taking a list or something, but in India, I learned differently. I learned that prayer isn't just about us trying to get God to do what we want God to do. 
but it's very much about us trying to get ourselves to become who God wants us to be, right? And to, to, to become uh, people who live differently in the world around us because we're worshiping Jesus and Jesus changes us, right? So we, every morning at five o'clock, we would kneel before the cross and we would adore Jesus. And I remember the prayers that we prayed. They were all about Jesus filling us with himself so that we could fill the world with God's love. They, they were prayers like, uh, Lord, let every person I meet feel Jesus in my touch, in my life. They said, let me uh, leave off the fragrance of Jesus everywhere I go. That's what we would pray, right? I realized what Paul meant when he said, the life I live, I no longer live, but Jesus lives in me, that we were praying that we would uh, become Jesus' love to the world. That's what it means to be the church, right? We are the body of Christ. I also thought it was peculiar that uh, in India, they, the, the sisters took communion every morning. They, they did the Eucharist, you know, and I, I thought, well, that's different. You know, like, why, why do you do it every day? And one of the nuns goes, well, you've heard the saying, we are what we eat. <laughs> Pretty much it. <laughs> that we are praying that we would become what we eat, right? That the, the body and the blood of Jesus would live in us, that the love of God would live in us. It's why it's so strange, isn't it, that Jesus said uh, to the disciples as he's leaving them, one of the most radical things I think in the world, he said, that you will do the same things I've been doing. And then he goes, he goes even further. He goes, and you will do even greater things than this because I'm going to the Father, but I'm going to leave the Spirit to live in you. Started thinking about that and what would it actually look like if we, as the body of Christ, believed that we had the power that lived in Jesus, that the love that lived in Jesus can live in us? What would it do to us? What would it do to the world? So, Mother Teresa had a great line when she commissioned you. You know, she would say, Calcuttas are everywhere if we'll only have eyes to see. So, pray that. You would have the eyes to see and to find your own Calcutta, that you would see injustice right where you are. You don't have to go to Calcutta to find Calcutta. It might be right around the corner. In fact, sometimes it's easier to love people on the other side of the world than the people right next to us. And so I kind of, we came back and over the last 20 years, we've been trying to figure that out. What does it mean to be the church right now at such a time as this? What does it mean to read the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other and I'm convinced of this. I mean, you know, so much of the Christianity I grew up with was about going up when we die, right? Uh, I mean, we had these really scary plays in Tennessee. We did this thing called Heaven's Gates and Hell's Flames. Yeah, where they would do these terrible skits. I mean, most skits are terrible. These are really bad, though. And they would, you know, you'd be in a car and the car would wreck and the demons would come and drag everybody that died to hell. And my friend's dad was the devil and he was real good, you know? And so, like... <laughs> literally scared the hell out of you. You know, it's a weird, like, we scared us into heaven, you know, and we became, uh, so much of Christianity has been obsessed with just getting people into heaven and escaping the world that we live in. But then you look at Jesus, and Jesus talks over and over, not about going up when we die, but bringing the kingdom down while we live, right? The kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. What would it look like if we said, well, what, we're, every day we're going to seek first the kingdom. We're going to seek that the kingdom would come on earth as it is in heaven. God's most perfect dream would come here. And so we've been having different beautiful experiments with that and on the north side of Philadelphia. But recently, one of our most powerful ones was uh, around this epidemic of gun violence in our country. A couple years ago, we had... Uh, a young man that was killed uh, again. We've had many. I could walk you through our neighborhood in almost every corner, tell you the stories of who was shot there. And so this time I heard the gunshots. I came out and I found this young man had fallen on my step and I, he was still alive. So I, I held his hand and I began praying with him. And, and, uh, and the ambulance came and they took him away. And, and uh, the next morning we found out that he had died. His name was Papito, 19 years old. And kind of comes that moment where Dr. King said, we're called to be the good Samaritan and lift our neighbor out of the ditch. But after you lift so many people out of the ditch, 
you start to say, maybe we need to rethink the whole road to Jericho. We got to do something about why people are landing in the ditch to begin with. So uh, it was right before Easter, this period of Lent, that the church often walks uh, up to the Easter celebration through the period of Lent. And so we said, this year, we're going to get our worship outside of our sanctuaries and we're going to take it into the streets. And we had stations of the cross, this, these stations where we remember the suffering of Jesus on the sites where people were killed. And then we had our Good Friday service the Friday before Easter. And we really felt the Spirit lead us to take the cross to the gun shop around the corner. Not just any gun shop, but one of the most irresponsible gun shops in the country for selling guns that end up being used in violent crimes. We put this, the cross there and we read the, the gospel narrative that's so familiar to many of us of Jesus' brutal, violent execution on the cross and how the women wept at the foot of the cross. But then we did something different. We invited the mothers after the gospel reading to share their testimonies, mothers that had lost their children. And something powerful happened where it was like the tears of those mothers 2,000 years ago met the tears of the mothers on our street. That Calvary met Kensington. And we began to see that this, this connection between the suffering of Jesus and the suffering of the moms on our street, it was powerful. you know. And we had some good Pentecostal preaching too about how it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. And in the end, we know the tomb is empty, but it was Friday. So we stayed in the pain and we remembered the suffering of Jesus. And this mother came up after me. She got tears rolling down her face and she says to me, I get it, I get it. I said, what? She said, God understands my pain. Because God knows what it feels like to lose your kid. And I realized it was Papito's mom. And that's the power of the gospel when it connects to the pain of the world, right? When liturgy makes its way to connect to the, the, the sad liturgy of violence in our world that we see that Jesus is a contradiction to this violent world that shows us uh, what God is like and God suffers with us. God knows what it feels like to lose your boy. So after that, we, we kept getting inspired. And one of the thing, by the way, the gun shop closed down. It's, a, it's housing for homeless veterans now. Hallelujah. But anyway, we ended up getting inspired by one particular image of the prophets. And it's this image that God's people will beat their swords into plows and their spears into pruning hooks. It's an image that the early church actually was compelled by. And you can see sermons from the early Christians where they preached on this text. And what they said is, this is who we are to be in the world. We worship Jesus who transformed an instrument of execution, right? The cross, which was only seen as an instrument of horror and humiliation like an electric chair today. That Jesus uh, blew that up and now we see the cross as a conduit of God's love and grace in the world. And they said, we're to transform this world from death to life. We're to turn the instruments of death into tools of life. And, and this image was greatly inspirational to them. And one of the things I love about it is that uh, it, it, it's this, this image that those things, those, those weapons that we are so familiar with become uh, transformed into something totally new, right? And, and we, we, we started thinking about this. And we're like, this is beautiful. If this is a trajectory of history, what are we waiting on, right? So we got a forge and some blacksmiths, right? And we uh, uh, got some welding lessons. And, and, uh, and then we uh, invited people to donate their guns because we said, you know... Um, we got like 300 million guns in this country, more guns than people, you know. Uh, so we probably got a few extras. And, and we, we, people started donating them from everywhere. It's amazing what you can do with Facebook and Twitter, right? Like uh, one of our first guns, uh, you'll, you'll see here, we, we had an uh, AK-47 donated, right? This guy was like, yeah, I got this thing. I'm not sure why. It's in my closet. I can't imagine much good coming of it, so I'm going to donate it. Well, this is what it looked like before, and then we took it to the forge, right? And check this out. This is what it looked like afterwards. Turned it into a shovel and a pitchfork, and it, it was uh, so uh, uh, magnetic that we started getting all of these other images from around the world. So this guy sent us a picture of a guitar that was made out of handguns, and it actually 
plays real music on that thing. And then we got an image from Mozambique of a, of a guy that in the middle of the conflict had, had turned an assault rifle into a saxophone that played real music. And then my friends in Iraq, I've had a, the wonderful chance to go to Iraq and Afghanistan to these lands that are so plagued by war and violence and extremism. And these uh, young kids had uh, poured guns into the street and they got this bulldozer. They were running over them. They said, check out, check out what we're doing in Iraq, right? They were crushing the guns. And they said, we want the kids to lead the way. Because it says, a child shall lead them. So that kid is driving the bulldozer, crushing them, right? And then, this is one of our most recent ones. Um, because most of our gun deaths come from handguns. And we, uh, we ended up finding one in an abandoned house. It's part of our problem, right? We've got guns everywhere. So we had this gun that we found in an abandoned house. And... Um, and when we took it to the forge, and instead of just uh, uh, having our blacksmith friends that uh, 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 did the work, we invited the victims' families, the moms and dads that had lost their kids, and they took the hammer. And I'll never forget uh, this incredible, courageous, daring mother, Miss Ryan. She took the, the the hammer, and she's got a picture of her son who was killed in a random shooting in Philadelphia. And she began to beat on this gun, and with every thump of the hammer, she said, "This is for my boy." Weeping, and in that moment, it felt like she wasn't just transforming the metal of a gun; she was transforming the world. And that is. What it looked like before was the gun. You'll see what it looked like now. We've now done this all over the country, but I, I think what we are meant to be in the world as a church, we are meant to turn this world from death to life. We are meant to interrupt death in every form. A lot of folks say they're pro-life, but uh, I mean, I think a lot of folks say they're pro-life, but they just mean they're pro-birth, they're anti-abortion. The fact is there are whole lots of issues of life, right? And it may be that America is the only place where you can be pro-guns, pro-war, pro-death penalty, and still say you're pro-life. But anyway, you know, like we want... To be the people of life, we follow the way, the truth, and the life. And so I pray today that as a church, we will fall in love with Jesus again. And ask, what if Jesus meant the stuff he said? Allow Jesus to transform us so we actually become a presence of love and life in the world. And I sure hope a generation from now, when they ask people, what do you think of when you hear the word Christian? That they don't say anti-gay, judgmental, and hypocritical. I hope they say love. I hope they say peace. I hope they, they say joy, kindness, gentleness, all the fruits of the Spirit. May the things that God is become who we are. Amen. Thank you.